100 years ago, Jin's powers were resurrected. Ferocious evil spirits rose up, threatening people. All living beings were controlled by it. But fortunately, extraordinary abilities awoke in people. The first to awaken desperately fought evil. Thus, four great outposts were founded, whose purpose was to protect people from evil spirits. Since childhood, Shan lived in one of the most criminal cities in the country, in Moj, where he would be forced to fight for his life. The guy was considered an incredible talent. He had a magic ball that helped him predict future crimes. The hero called the police to report that a sexual crime would occur at Sophie's hotel, and his father was the buyer. He was also famous for his extraordinary dexterity. He was able to outwit a man, attacking him with a stick, and wounded him with a sharp blade. He could easily attract attention by communicating with criminals. They hoped that he could surprise them. He interested them at first sight. The young man, born in a criminal city, was without knowing it, a hope in the struggle of people. Everyone was wondering who he would grow up to be. It's night outside and the moon is shining brightly. We find ourselves in the apartment with the hero in which he lives with his father. On the table, there is a note with the hotel number. His father, Sonny, is preparing for a fun evening. He combs his hair, saying that a man at 40 ages like wine, getting better every year. The man continued his preparations. He sprayed perfume on himself and told his son that food was on the table and if he was hungry, he could warm it up. Sean studied the legislation of his city, not paying much attention to his father. He answered him in the affirmative. Already leaving the apartment, Sonny asked his son not to stay up late since he had exams tomorrow morning. In parting, the father shared that he was going on a date and also encouraged the guy, hoping that he would successfully pass everything tomorrow. As soon as Sonny left the apartment, his son immediately closed the book and dialed the police number on the phone. He said that he was absolutely sure that a crime of a sexual nature would occur in Sophie's hotel in room 302. When the operator asked how he was related to the potential criminal, the answer was that he was his father and that it was his duty to report the crime. Sean sat down at the table and started eating dinner. He was looking forward to tomorrow's awakening ceremony, hoping that he would actually be able to open the patterned egg. He didn't understand where a certain scroll in his head came from, looking like a list of the dead, and he was curious if something would change after awakening. After eating, he put the dishes in the sink and sat down again to read the Moj legislation, when suddenly a call came on his phone from the police station. After answering the call, he heard the voice of his father, who swore heavily and complained about bad luck, and also demanded that he quickly bring money to the station and pay bail for him. But Sean had no money. Then Sonny took the key under his bed and went to the neighboring house of the widow Wang. He could find cash under a vat of preparations. The guy followed the instructions and was able to find 2,000 lying under the jug, but he was not going to give them to his father. Calling the police again, he said that he would not pay bail for his relative because breaking the law should be punishable. He has to re-educate Sonny properly and also to make him a useful member of society because they must honor and protect the foundations of the city's law. The main character is running on the street in the rain. He is holding the hand of a girl who can barely keep up with him. They're trying to get rid of the chase. They were shot from behind from a bow. The arrows flew almost next to the hero, almost hitting him. But managing to bounce off, they landed on the asphalt. They tried to escape from the crowd of armed people, but soon they came up against a dead end, a high wall with barbed wire. One of those who were catching up with a bat in his hands and a mohawk noticed that the heroes continued to run away from them and also grinned at the fact that they also wanted to leave the city. The man ordered his comrades to attack the heroes and kill them, but the guys were not timid and took out their hacksaws. Sean, with his unique dexterity, cut everyone who stood in his way. And in the end, no one was left alive except the two of them. Eli invited her friend to leave. He took out of his pocket a certain ticket with the inscription passage on it and doors opened in front of him, from which a bright light emanated. Early in the morning, the hero woke up in his bed, and after his daily rituals, he went to school. He heard a conversation between two classmates. They were very worried yesterday and therefore did not get enough sleep. They wanted to know if they could wake up and pull out the patterned ones. Sean walked into the preparatory class, where their homeroom teacher, Lupini, announced that the awakening exam would begin in an hour. The man was sure that now they all hoped to awaken themselves and pull out good talent, and also advised them to kill all the evil spirits, conquer the city, and gain universal respect. He also added that it is worth drowning enemies in their own blood, helping people flourish, and making them respect them. But if they remain behind, serving the people, then they tried in vain. Lupin beat his chest, urging the others to do the same. The guys in the class chanted slogans uttered by him, 
and also beat his hand in the air. The hero was not sure that he supported the words of the teacher. He did not understand why he was talking about serving the people. But the man was not happy with the guy. He looked at the watch on his hand and then notified the rest of the class that the time had come. They could all head to the wake-up point. All the students got up from their seats. Some were talking among themselves. And the teacher continued to look at the hero. He was wondering how many patterns he would wake up. The young people lined up in three lines. They passed under the scanning frames. And then they were given the result of the award of eggs. They rejoiced at how many patterned eggs they received. Many received four pieces each and hoped that they would hatch a power system and be able to join the police department, after which they would not have to worry. Since the resurrection of Jin, animals have increased in size and become stronger, and extraordinary powers have also awakened in people. During the awakening, an egg awakens behind a person. The patterns on it determine the abilities of the awakened one. The maximum possible number of patterns is nine and the one who has all the patterns awakened will become the greatest living. Sean was next in line, he walked up to the frame, and the teacher asked if he had any metal objects. The guy claimed that he always carries a couple of knives with him for self-defense. Lupine asked to remove all weapons, since awakening equipment is very expensive, and metal can affect the test results. The hero began to look for hidden knives in his clothes. One was in his sleeve, the second in his belt, and a couple more were hidden under his jacket. The people around were surprised by the number of hidden weapons and could not understand why he needed them. Having pulled out all the available knives, a rather large collection had accumulated. Sean tried to walk under the metal detector again, but it continued to beep. So the teacher again asked if there were any prohibited items left. The hero thought about it. He couldn't remember if he had any other bladed weapons with him, but suggested that perhaps it was all because of his iron will. Lu Pain became very angry at the guy's words and flared up with anger. He ordered him to pull out everything. Then the hero took off his jacket and shook out all the contents. The guy was upset that he was forced to give up all the cutting objects. He said that there was nothing left, not even any trump cards. After passing the frame, he was allowed to the next stage. The magic ball, he touched it, and the screen in front of him lit up blue. Resting his hand on the ball, something happened that had never happened before. A huge red egg appeared behind the hero's back, and the ball released rays of light. He received the maximum allowed number of patterned eggs. The number was displayed on the screen, and everyone around witnessed this amazing gift. Sean turned to the teacher, hinting that the equipment was broken, but Lupin, approaching the ball, did not notice any problems. Then the guy, for no apparent reason, broke the ball with his hand, which shocked the teacher. The hero reported that he was now definitely broken. The man grabbed the guy by the hand and dragged him along, said that this was damage to public property, and that he would go with him. The hero did not resist. The teacher summoned a huge magical creature in the form of a bird. They sat on its tail and flew into the sky. The people below followed them with their gaze. Suddenly the hero noticed that his scroll with names had reacted and a previously unseen drawing was imprinted on the papyrus. The hero ended up in the principal's office. A girl in uniform stood next to the man. He read out a note from the personal file of a guy who entered their school six months ago at the age of 18. Then the director noticed that the hero came from a criminal city, and Lupin and the girl were very surprised by what they heard. It shocked them, but the hero didn't care about their words. He was trying to understand what happened to the scroll. According to his data, it was supposed to open after awakening. He was wondering what kind of power this was and what the drawing on the paper meant, when suddenly he was brought out of his thoughts by Lupin, who drew the hero's attention to the director talking to him. Harry pondered the fact that Sean had gotten an egg with nine patterns. He was lucky, even though he was previously a resident of a crime-ridden city. He turned to the hero and decided to ask him a strange question. He was interested in what the guy would do if one day he woke up six or nine times. Sean, without the slightest hesitation, immediately stated that he would serve the people. He had no other answer in his head, as if he already knew in advance what to answer. Harry was both stunned and delighted by such an answer which was not typical for people from a criminal area. He noticed the guy's high thoughts. Then the director asked what Sean had previously dreamed of doing. Then the guy told about his father and denouncing him for going to a prostitute. Everyone felt awkward because of this. Harry then suggested that the guy rest first and not tell anyone about the results of the awakening while he thought about what to do with his studies. Sean didn't linger any longer and thanked him and left the office. The director was wondering how a guy with such good inclinations got out of the crime-ridden city. The hero came to his house. He immediately realized that someone had broken into his apartment. There was someone's blood on the handle of the front door. 
everything in the bedroom was stained with the blood of an unknown guy. He was frantically looking for something, simultaneously throwing out all the things from the closet. The thief heard that someone had come home. He tried to hide around the corner, holding a dagger in his hand and trying to peek who was there. But Sean got ahead of him. He put his blade next to his artery, which warned the guy that if he pressed a little harder, he could kill him. Seeing the amount of blood splattered, the hero said that washing the floors infuriates him. But the guy was in a hurry to justify himself. He did not hurt anything, but only removed the medicine. Sean pointed his finger at the cabinet and told him that the healing potion was on the second shelf in front. But the thief did not move. Then the hero noticed that he should take the medicine, since he was seriously injured. But the guy said that he did not need it. The uninvited guest asked if the owner of the apartment wanted to kill him. But it was illegal to kill outside the criminal city, the hero noted, despite the fact that Sean still held the blade next to the thief's throat. He breathed a sigh of relief, and then said that he owed the guy his life and promised to repay the debt. The hero decided to take advantage of the situation, and since the guest himself announced that he would now owe him, asked him to kill himself. Alex did not understand at all what was happening, because before that he had said that he did not need his life. Then he offered to kill someone for the hero for free, since he is a murderer. Sean still held the knife to the thief's throat. He agreed to the offer and continued to insist that the guy kill himself. After these words, Alex got nervous. He didn't do anything, so why does the hero still want his death? But Sean explained that he broke into his room and stained the floor with blood. In another city, he would already be dead. The thief was surprised to hear about the criminal city. He said that even there, there is an annual quota for the acquittal of one person. The hero was already tired of listening to the guest's complaints. Then Alex tried to suck up for the last time and agreed that he was to blame. So he suggested that the guy start killing him. The guy closed his eyes and mentally said goodbye to the world, hoping that in his next life, he would definitely become the best killer in the world. Despite the fact that the blade was still at the thief's throat, Sean did not give it a move. The guy was interested in why he had not died yet. He asked why the owner of the apartment did not start killing him to which Sean repeated that outside the crime-ridden city, taking someone's life is illegal. Alex completely freaked out. He thought that they were mocking him since they didn't kill him. Then it was worth letting him go. And then he thought that since the guy constantly repeats about legality and illegality, then it's worth pointing this out to him. The guy hinted that since Sean so respects the code of laws, then holding someone against his will is also a crime, for which punishment is provided in the form of imprisonment. Then the hero asked how old he was, and upon learning that he was only 17, he realized that the uninvited guest had not even woken up yet. Finally removing the dagger from the guy's neck and putting it under his jacket, he allowed him to leave on his own, which greatly surprised the thief. Sean, without a moment's hesitation or second thought, turned and walked away from the guy and then waved goodbye to him. Alex was very happy about this news and the fact that he finally got rid of the eccentric and ran towards the exit. As soon as he made his way to the door and opened it, rejoicing at the sudden freedom, the hero's hand suddenly grabbed him by the t-shirt, and then he pushed the uninvited visitor back inside the apartment with all his strength, causing him to scream in surprise. Alex fell to the floor. He did not understand what was happening and immediately asked with fear what the hero was doing. But Sean explained that he had already left the room, and now it was not restricting his freedom. So this could not be considered an unlawful detention. The floor around was covered in splashes of blood, the hero noted that the guy was seriously wounded and it was better for him not to move again. And he would also bring him medicine now. He threw the stranger a little in a brush and told him that he should wipe off all his splattered blood from the floor. Alex began to try to wash away the red stains, which pleasantly surprised Sean, who still doubted that he could make him do it. He then found a bottle of the required pills in the closet and handed them to the guy, who immediately thanked him. And then Sean informed him that the expiration date had expired. He wanted to provoke the guy into negative emotions to test the theory that Alex was angry because he gave him expired medications. Sean knew that energy was born from negative emotions, but he had to cause them. And as soon as he got what he wanted, he again felt changes in the scroll. Then he said that he was just joking and the elixir was normal and also advised him to take it quickly. Otherwise, the guy would die from blood loss in half an hour. Alex took the medicine and also bandaged his wounds. Sean observed him and noted that he did not look like a killer at all. The guy admitted that he missed only once and he needed time. He was sure that he would soon become the greatest killer. Offended that Sean did not understand him, he puffed out his cheeks and turned away. But the hero advised him to devote himself entirely to this matter. Otherwise, he would not achieve success. He wanted to know if it was worth it, and Alex said that he was not afraid of death. 
He wanted to die nobly, like a real killer. But the hero asked why he didn't kill him. Then he could calmly leave. But the uninvited guest had his own professional principles. If he was paid, he would help. For him, it was a job, not a hobby, and no one hired him to kill him. Sean tricked the boy by implying that it was all because he simply couldn't do it, and he had already begun to believe his story. The killer in him has not yet awakened, so he can hire him. He himself has only recently become an adult and will soon undergo the awakening ceremony. But it turned out that Alex lied about his age and then received the order, but he could not have expected how it would turn out for him. He didn't know that there was such a big difference between the awakened and the unawakened, even if he only awakened a spoon. Sean listened to his words and then offered to get medical treatment and also reminded him of the need to wash the floors and also asked him to throw out the trash on the way out. Alex was again surprised that the hero let him go so freely. Then Sean again filled in what he needed to do in order to leave. And after he finishes with all his affairs, he can be free. Otherwise, he will owe him his life. And if necessary, he will find him himself. Finally, Sean decided to share that, in fact, not everyone who awakens is as strong as the guest thinks. 100 years ago, Jin's powers were resurrected, causing all the evil spirits to rebel, as well as turning animals into controllable monsters that went on a rampage threatening the kingdom of people. But fortunately, the first awakened ones appeared and, sacrificing their strength and lives, they founded four great outposts. The outpost of pacification of evil spirits, the outpost of dawn, the dome outpost, and the demon outpost have joined forces in the fight against monsters, and human masters stand on their guard, not allowing evil to pass through. Sean walked through the streets of a city. He heard how people around him were scared after reading the news that the pacification outpost had failed. The townspeople were surprised that this happened and wanted to know what happened. They were worried because monsters appeared in another town and many people were hurt. The men looked at the phone, seeing the image of a revived monster, not understanding how this could happen and why the Ministry of Exile could not resist them. They were already uneasy, although nothing had happened in their city yet. They expected that they might also be unlucky. Sean walked for a long time until he finally turned into a narrow street and ran into a store, which is where he headed his way. Inside, he met the salesman, who was not very happy with his appearance. The man had a scar all over his face. Seeing the hero, he said that his goods were already here, and also that this was the last time, and now they were even. Leaving the store, the guy said goodbye to the man, saying that they would see each other again, which slightly surprised the seller. He was angry when he heard that this was not their last meeting, and promised that they would not be able to see each other soon. The hero returned to his home, sat down on the sofa, he decided to open the package with the order and took out a demonic crystal from it. The quintessence that evil spirits create after absorbing human vitality. Then the guy took his bow and arrows. He set up several crossbows around his room, tying a long red thread to each of them, which he held in his hands. Sitting in the center of the room and holding the threads, he activated his patterned egg behind his back and began to meditate at the outpost for pacifying the evil spirits. Meanwhile, Several men in red cloaks were climbing to the top of the mountain, but on the way they came across an old man who was meditating on the top of a rock, and without even opening his eyes, he informed the wanderers that the road was closed. One of them smiled and apologized, saying that they just wanted to move on along the road. But the elder looked at them and again repeated his words about the closed road. But this time, he was more convincing, but the man insisted. Then the old man activated his magical powers and trying to intimidate the people in the red cape, said that then they would face death, which greatly frightened them. Seeing the terrible funnel of darkness above their heads, they immediately changed their tone, raised their hands above their heads, and said that they were just joking. One of them admitted that his divine instruction serves the human race, sacrificing everything and not daring to challenge the elder. Deciding to leave immediately, he finally turned to the monk with a request to give him advice, if any. The monk asked to inform the divine throne upon their return, so that they change their name to unclean instruction, since they do not care about people. If he had to defend this place, where it was not appropriate to raise a hand, then they would already be dead. The man promised to convey his words and thanked him for the advice. They went another way, and the elder watched them. He used his staff to turn on his abilities. A week later, the hero was still sitting on the floor, cross-legged, and the magic crystal was floating in the air and emitting scarlet light when suddenly the phone rang. Having answered the call, he recognized Lupin's voice. He asked the guy to return to school in the morning, as a person from the Ministry of Exile would come and the students would be assessed. 
This certification is very important, since only one will win, and resources will be allocated for him. And it does not matter whether the hero wins, it is important to try. The teacher then asked why his father wasn't answering, to which Sean noted that they don't allow phones in prison. He did not immediately understand what the hero was talking about, since he had practically forgotten that the boy had turned his father over to the police for dating prostitutes. The main character went to the wall calendar in his apartment. There was a sheet with the month January. The hero calculated that there were still three 12 days left. The next day, he came to class and sat down in his place. Everyone around was discussing whether they would be chosen to awaken. Everyone wanted to learn how to drive away monsters. Everyone fell silent as soon as the teacher entered the office and said that a notification had just arrived about a change in the certification format. This time, they came not only from the Ministry of Exile, but also reserve officers from the Ministry of Security. Each school will nominate five students for elimination. The guys in the class really hoped that they would be chosen. One of them did not even hope to pass the certification. He wanted to shine his face among the lucky ones. Then Lupine said that the director decided to choose Sean from their class. He pointed his finger at him, but the guy did not listen to them at all and looked thoughtfully out the window. Classmates were very indignant at this choice. They considered the guy a weakling and called the name Morris, thinking that he was more worthy. Lupine had to shout at the young people to shut up. Then he lectured them about the injustice of this life. If they did this to you, then endure and improve yourself until one day you break this injustice. And before that, it is useless to shout. Sean headed to the director's office as he wanted to talk to the guy, surprised that he was so cheerful and then asked if everything was okay with Sonny. The guy replied that fraud in a criminal city is expensive, which is why all the people in the office did not know what to answer, being in shock. Harry said that the certification checks not only the students, but also the school. Their city is small and therefore the management is planning a merger. But who will be the director of the new school depends on this exam. So everyone will benefit, the man asked the hero, not to give in under any circumstances. Sean was not very interested in all these details. He only wanted to know what he would get for winning, what their price would be. Harry was a little surprised by this question, but Sean explained that the criminal city has recovered in return for the service you must pay. He didn't want to do anything for free. Then Harry said that he would get certified, and it was beneficial for both of them. Sean understood that the director needed him to take on this matter, and the exam was just a ticket that someone had to finance. You could say it's a fee, and since in a crime-ridden city, people who don't follow the rules die pretty quickly, the guy decided to warn them about it. Then, Harry became very tense. He did not want to pay the hero for participation, but in the end, he agreed and offered to give three crystals of the first level. Sean agreed to the offer and then decided whether he would have to kill someone during the certification or not. The witnesses were very frightened by this question, the director assured the guy that there was no need to kill anyone, to which the hero noted that it was forbidden to do this outside the city. Harry asked the guy to rest on the school bus and that he should not worry about other students and urgently asked not to kill anyone. Already on the bus, other guys approached Sean. One of them introduced himself as Chen. His girlfriend's name was Yanni and the other guy's name was Kai. Chen sat down next to Sean and he shared the gossip that this time the mayor of the city would secretly attend the certification, despite the fact that their city is very small. The prime minister of their city was also Elder Moj. He believed that the best master defenders came from there, giving away resources. They raised a new generation. And if you join Moj, you will become famous. So the exam will be closely watched, and this is a unique opportunity to become successful. Chen believed that other schools also had a lot of masters, and they would choose one, and the rest would be taken to help so the chances would increase. Yanni was confident that Elder Chen would win. His father is the head of the security department and also offered her help to him in the future. The guy immediately became proud of her words. He believed that he was now definitely obliged to win since the other guys believed in him so much. Then he shared that the prospects with him would be brilliant. And Sean asked if his father was really the head of the security department. Chen, with his characteristic pride, confirmed the girl's words. And the hero shared that his father is now in prison. The headman immediately offered to help release his father if he had not done anything serious. But the hero, on the contrary, asked to increase the term. The guy was very surprised by such a request. He definitely didn't expect that someone could ask him about this. He stared at Sean and mumbled something in response. Chen was trying to figure out how much he had to hate his own father in order to put him in prison and ask for a tougher sentence. In fact, Sean tried to anger the guy so that gray energy would be released and a scroll would appear. But something went wrong. The bus continued to move on. They left the city limits. 
Then Chen asked where they were going and why the certification would not be carried out in the city. Then he decided to contact the driver with this question, since an incident had occurred in a neighboring city and it was not at all safe there. But the driver was not mistaken on the road. They temporarily changed the venue to the old factory. There was more space there and he asked them not to worry. The head man again addressed the driver, asking him to wake them up as soon as they reached the place as they should rest before the exam. After some time, they arrived at the plant where in addition to them, there were other buses with the same potential winners. They all got off the school transport, happy to finally arrive, and then spotted the local star. His name is Oscar, and he is the talent of the six patterns. Everyone liked his beard, and they discussed why he grew it. Sean didn't want to be like everyone else, so he stepped aside, but Chen caught up with him. He asked the guy to avoid Oscar, since he is very strong. The hero walked on, and the headman told him after him that he hoped he would not lose, and called him number two on the team of their school. Meanwhile, the driver finished his cigarette and then headed inside to the office with cameras. His partner asked how things were on the street. The man noted that everyone is not very attentive and easily trusts strangers and also thinks naively. So a remote city with self-government is just a dream. But then he grinned and pointed at Sean, who was flashing on the screen. The man was sure that this guy would be of interest to them. They lined up in two rows in front of the teacher, who announced that he was leading the team and the topics for the certification were not yet known. He should have waited for the people from the Ministry of Exorcism. Then everything would be clear, but in his opinion, this was a unique opportunity for them. Lupin looked at the hero, although he addressed everyone. He asked them to be careful and act with a sober head. Only then would there be a chance of success. The teacher was very interested in the guy. He was curious if he could surprise them all again with his talents. Suddenly, they heard an SUV approaching the plant. It was flying at great speed and then abruptly stopped right in front of the participants. Mason, a heavily inflated man, got out of the car. He had an unlit cigarette in his mouth. He walked past the guys without saying anything. Approaching Lupin, he placed his hands on his shoulders and greeted the teacher. They had not seen each other for many years, and he was wondering how he ended up there. The leader explained that he works as a teacher, which greatly surprised Mason, who could not understand at all how this was possible. Lupin was missing the little finger on his right hand. And then the examiner lit a cigarette and concluded that it wasn't that bad, at least not as dangerous as theirs. Then he looked intently through his glasses at the guys lined up in a row and suggested that then perhaps these were his students. Classmates were very scared when they noticed that Mason was staring at them. He made them nervous and they wanted to know where he came from so serious, but he didn't evoke any emotions in Sean and coming very close to him, he asked why the guy wasn't afraid of him like the others. The hero could not understand why he, in fact, should be afraid of him. And Mason laughed, noting to his friend that this guy was quite interesting. The man finally decided to introduce himself. He came from the Ministry of Exile, captain of the third detachment, the fifth generation of the Awakened. He decided not to talk about the rest of his achievements, since there is nothing interesting there. So there is nothing to praise himself about. He then began to think about the topic of today's assessment, trying to figure out what would be the best option for them. After a few seconds, he was finally able to come to a conclusion and came up with the idea that the guys would have to win the fight, the loser leaves, the winner stays. The guys didn't see any catch in this and were surprised that it would be so easy. But then Mason called his dragon and suggested they start. The dragon circled around the field, creating an impromptu ring. If someone gives up or goes outside the circle, then this is also considered a defeat. He pointed to the two guys standing first in the row and called for them to start fighting first, and they entered the ring. The first introduced himself as Jake. He took a pose, folded one hand into a fist, and covered it with the other, and asked those present for instructions. Jake pushed off the ground well and jumped high above his opponent. They began to fight, but their movements were difficult to make out because of the dust around them. Mason noted that they do not have an ounce of military strength, but they are from a small town where they were never taught martial arts. Jake was able to hold his own in the fight, and although he himself suffered a lot, his opponent was lying on the ground. The guy asked them not to laugh at his performance, but the captain still found it funny, even though he won. Then he called Sean and Oscar, who was sure that he would beat the hero. Lupin watched the guy carefully. He still hoped that he was not mistaken about him and that in the end, he would be surprised. Having entered the ring, Sean turned to the examiner with a question. He wanted to clarify whether it was possible to use weapons during a fight. Mason confirmed that this is not prohibited and everyone around laughed at such a question because now his opponent can also use anything for defense. The hero's classmate encouraged him, 
Then the captain announced the start of the competition, and Sean took his position, kneeling down and preparing for a lightning-fast run. Oscar did not expect such speed from the boy, and without even having time to react, he suddenly received a deep cut with a blade on his hand, from which blood immediately flowed. The guy screamed in pain, holding his hand, but Sean had already put his palm on his face and knocked the enemy onto his back. Then he took out his knife from behind his back and was ready to stab, but Oscar begged for mercy because this was a simple competition and asked not to kill him. But Sean was adamant. He was ready to inflict another wound, but changed his mind and hit the ground with his blade next to the enemy's ear. The opponent shouted that the hero was mocking him, and Mason was delighted and laughed at the guy's resourcefulness. But suddenly Sean grabbed Oscar by the face and put his fingers into his mouth. He was trying to find something and everyone watching did not understand why he pulled out the guy's tooth. The hero didn't understand why the poison wasn't hidden under the tooth. Maybe he put it somewhere else. Mason thought that he was trying to find the poison and was a little surprised by this outcome. Then the man suggested that perhaps the opponent did not try to hide the poison. Maybe he did not hide it at all. Never thought about it. But Sean did not understand how this was possible. Because if Oscar had been captured by an enemy and he would not have had the opportunity to kill himself, then his torment would have been worse than instant death. His opponent thought about this option because indeed, if he hid the poison, then he could kill himself at any time. Immediately realizing the stupidity of such a thought, because why would he hide something? He has a wonderful life and he absolutely does not want to die. Mason realized that this was not an ordinary city dweller in front of him and asked if he was from a criminal city. The hero confirmed and was still surprised that no one was hiding poison outside his homeland. The captain then turned to Lupin. He wanted to know whether the teacher knew about this or not and the hero still continued to sit on top of his defeated opponent. The teacher noted that according to the rules, it does not matter whether you committed a heinous crime. After leaving, it is not discussed, unless he killed again. Otherwise, one day, without mistakes, would have been enough for the guy. And then he would have become Lupin's student forever. But Sean didn't quite understand what he was talking about. Mason refused to continue the conversation. It was not important for him, since his enemies were evil spirits, not people and then announced the end of the test. He told the students that they could be located somewhere at the plant, and tomorrow they would continue their certification. Then he approached the teacher with a proposal, but he could not while his students were there. Mason hinted to Lupin that his student from the Forbidden City might not pass the test. It was difficult for him to guess whether he would cope further. Kai was very upset when he got inside the factory. It was dirty. There were rats running everywhere, and he didn't want to stay there overnight. One of the students approached the teacher. He wanted to clarify, since he was in doubt whether the level in the future depended on the level of talent in the present. The guy also asked why the captain didn't look at their talents, to which the teacher explained that talent alone cannot lead to the top, because there are enough geniuses everywhere. And with such a large population, their appearance is completely common. If only one talent was required to exercise evil spirits, then people would have defeated the monsters a long time ago. He had already met quite a few extraordinary people in his life, but he doubted that many of them were able to rise to the occasion. Considering your talent, an extraordinary gift is tantamount to arrogance, but this does not protect you from making the simplest mistakes. The lucky ones from the best schools hindered the outpost of humility. They trembled with fear, did not kill anyone, and were beheaded. He saw that they needed someone stronger than all of them. Since the guys have not yet managed to go through four outposts, they do not know that human life there means absolutely nothing. Life there is perceived as something cheaper than a sip of water or a piece of bread. In addition to talent, character and luck were required to survive. Without decisiveness, without a cool head, without sufficient prudence, they will be just a mockery for everyone. Having finished his explanation, he asked them to finally rest before the certification. But Kai decided to approach Lupini and stated that it was too dirty for him to sleep here. The teacher was extremely indignant because there was no time to be disdainful. He shared that sleeping without a feeling of confidence that you will wake up in the morning is much worse. He ordered them to sit down and decided to tell them that compared to the four outposts, their conditions seemed quite rosy to him. He then pointed to Sean, who sat quietly, pressed against the wall. He was not better than the rest, but he did not dare to act arrogant. The hero opened his eyes and noticed that everyone else was looking at him. Then he decided to get up and go for a walk, answering the others that he was going to the toilet. Chen admitted to Yanni, that it seemed to him that Sean, although gloomy, was a good guy. Although the girl did not understand why he decided so, and asked to be more specific. 
The hero left the room. He tried to find out where the cameras were, thinking that he had found the last one and wanted to know if there was anything else at this plant. He tried to imagine a map of the building to understand where there was a place that was not crammed with observation devices, which were practically everywhere. The hero rushed into the only room where, in his opinion, there were no cameras and no one would be watching him there. Walking down the corridor and past the video surveillance, he reached one office where lights and voices were coming from. He heard them discussing Lupin. The driver suggested that the teacher had previously been at the outpost for pacifying evil spirits, and here he was wasting his talent. The man planned to offer him a transfer to the regional center, since his pedagogical methods deserve attention. Sean returned to the factory. Everyone was already sleeping on the floor, but Lupin heard him arrive and asked if he had prepared a lone wolf plan. In the middle of the night, they heard a strange sound. The hero took out his crossbow for self-defense, when suddenly the teacher said that the sound did not concern him. Lupin watched the departing guy and thought to himself that he felt sorry for him, since loners most often suffer a tragic end. Meanwhile, Mason was standing on the street. A huge dog was sitting on a chain next to him. He was grinning at the students. He was going to teach them all a lesson so that they would know what the awakened ones who dared to sleep in the open air were really facing. The captain let go of the chain and the dog rushed toward the plant with an animal growl, while the man remained standing by his car, deciding to light a cigarette. Those watching from the cameras saw the demon. They considered Mason an idiot for wanting to watch students killing evil spirits. Although they had not even graduated from school yet, they started to wake up the driver, but once he saw what was happening, he simply continued to sit there, asking them to stop panicking. Mike believed that one demon would not cause many problems. On the contrary, it was necessary to test the education of students in practice so that they would at least look at the blood. But observers were perplexed because there would be too many consequences because of this. And it was no joke to play with the lives of teenagers. The chief took off his jacket and showed them the emblem on his arm, noting that it would help eliminate all unpleasant things as well as prevent them. Having calmed them down a little, he lit a cigarette adding that it wouldn't hurt the guys to be active, so they would understand what they were worth. The demon dog flew into the factory building. Everyone began to run away and scream in fear. They could not understand how the monster ended up there. The guys called for help. Oscar rushed first into battle with the dog, promising to protect them all, but the demon immediately broke his bat into small pieces and threw the guy away. Then Chen stepped in. He called on them to cast aside fear and unite their efforts in the fight against the monster. Only then it would not be able to harm them. But the certification participants were still very scared. They tried to call the teacher for help, but he had already quietly left there. Leaning against the wall, he stood directly in front of the camera and, looking into it, asked the observers whether they really considered this test useful. But Mike continued to look at the screen. He grinned that Oscar and Chen were so brave, but they did not know that the head of the hellhound was the strongest. Although he found stubbornness to be a good characteristic, he suddenly remembered Sean, who irritated him terribly, and then they noticed that the guy was nowhere to be found. Approaching the door, he allowed them not to look for the guy. But as soon as he opened it, he noticed the hero standing, wondering why he was there. Had he really come to sit? The examiner shouted at him, not understanding how he was able to find them. But Sean explained that he was simply following their tracks, doubting that he could follow such vague traces to them. One of them suggested that these were all echoes of the criminal city in it. Then they decided to ask the guy why he didn't go to help his classmates. The hero said that it was because no one would die. Then Mike gave him an ultimatum. If Sean does not volunteer to save them, then he refuses to help them and the students could die. But the hero was sure that the hellhound was too weak an opponent. And even if he did not help them, they would still survive. The chief examiner became enraged by these words. He began to threaten that he would specifically increase the monster's powers in order to provoke the hero into action. Sean noted that if the man does what he promises, then it will be considered a premeditated assault, which is punishable by imprisonment or the death penalty. Then the man decided to try again to express an ultimatum, hinting that he himself would now go to deal with the participants, whether after that the hero would go to save them or not. The observers decided that the guy was nervous, that he was calm, and again answered that he would not go to them in this case either. Mike couldn't understand how he could do this to his classmates. Would he really just watch them die? Why was he so selfish? Sean assumed that he couldn't cope with the captain, so why try to die himself? Then it would be better to inform the police and get benefits for them. According to the new school policy, if a student dies while performing a task, then a payment is due. And if you inform on the killer, 
you can receive a reward for that too. If 10 students are killed, a warrant will be issued for the arrest of a particularly dangerous criminal. So he wanted to know if they would be killed. Mike became very nervous. Meanwhile, on the street near the factory, three young men stood, crying out to the God who was watching over them as the starlight washed over them. They hoped that this time their plan would succeed and they would have a chance to rise and become servants of God, which would be the greatest mercy for them. Their goal was to kill all these smartest students at the school. They persistently chanted this call into the sky. Then, starting to pray, they asked that their lives become payment and asked God to atone for all their sins. Deciding to wait another half hour to proceed with the plan, they continued to stand on the cliff in front of the building, watching the test. The action takes us to the office of the head of the department. Lenny receives a call. He is approached with a request to conclude a deal. He is informed that a small favor is required. In 10 minutes, a motorcade will leave from the north to the south of the city, and the guards must let them through. Having clarified that these are heretics, he persistently asks to indicate the price for completing this task. He did not have time to listen to them. The head organized certification for schools from distant cities, including Moby, where it was in full swing. There were only 12 students, and they were checking whether it would be possible to fulfill their request. Lenny said that a deal always has a guarantor and was ready to end the conversation when the caller said that he was the customer. So there was no point in bargaining. They were ready to kill the children. The boss had no choice but to agree to the deal. And he said that it would be invalid if at least one person died. Finally, he promised that in six months, everyone in their province would rise up again and destroy their sect. Mike was still standing in the office. He regretted that he had lost a lot of money. For each student, he could have received 30,000, and there were 10 of them. Sean pointed to the screen and asked if they could provide him with a recording of their test. The driver wanted to know what he planned to do with it. Sean explained that during the assessment, the answers are unknown. If you mistakenly think that someone is in real danger and then save them, you can get even more money. The chief believed that the guy was completely insolent. It was dishonest towards the other students. Then he promised to report him to the commission so that he would be kicked out. The observers agreed with Mike. They were happy with his words. But Sean decided to try his luck again and offered to give them half of the reward. They immediately changed their faces. The main one was delighted at such a possible fruitful cooperation and promised to sort everything out himself. Meanwhile, Oscar and Chen were still trying to fight the hound. They were already quite tired and admired how the hero had foreseen everything and carried a knife with him. A classmate was upset that the guy was not with them. He was wondering where he had disappeared to and promised to call him father if he returned now. When suddenly a hero appeared behind the possessed dog, Chen was very surprised by the sudden appearance of his new dad, but they were still angry with him for leaving them in the thick of things. The hero tried to lie that he was in the toilet, but it was impossible not to hear their screams. The main character decided to come closer to them, simply passing by the dog, which paid absolutely no attention to him. Oscar couldn't believe how it was possible that he just walked by and didn't even look at the hellhound, just as she didn't look at him. The guy admitted, although he didn't understand why he thought so, that they would be much safer next to the hero. Sean thought for a moment and then wondered if he could seriously hurt his classmates, leaving them completely bewildered. Suddenly, out of the blue, Chen began to writhe in pain and Oscar began to lie on the floor, also screaming in pain. No one understood what was happening. Sean looked at the cameras and then stood in front of the dog. He couldn't believe that such a ferocious demon would bully his comrades when they vowed to fight for the lives of people. Mike watched the screen. He was glad that the hero speaks so well. Now Moj will definitely be touched and send him money. And there's nothing wrong with the video, but he still doubted whether he was right to give control of the hound to the guy because in this way he gave him more room for maneuver, and maybe he would refuse to cooperate with him in the future. Suddenly they noticed that Sean attacked the dog and began to beat it, while saying that protecting his comrades was his sacred duty. The guy approached Chen, continuing to say that if he had not come on time, his comrade could have died from this ferocious demon. Mike was very angry, seeing that the hero was greatly overacting. They might not believe him, and he definitely did not want to lose the freebie. The enemy was defeated, the hound lay on the ground motionless, the students came out to look at it. They were surprised that everything ended so easily. Oscar was very upset that despite the fact that they were all students, the gap between them was so large, he began to doubt his abilities. Suddenly, everyone turned around at the entrance because a stranger broke into the plant. He shouted that the gods were with him. No one understood what was happening. Charlie continued to scream. He notified everyone that he was granting new souls to the gods. 
Chen recognized him as the awakened first level. The disciples were greatly surprised when they realized that a heretic had appeared before him. They were curious where he had come from. Chen remembered the rumor that non-believers killed mercilessly, and Oscar hoped that this would not be the topic of their assessment. The guys understood perfectly well that a first-level awakened one was much stronger than a hellhound, and their only hope now was Sean. The hero's classmates began to pretend that everything hurt them. They decided to send him to battle with the heretic, and the hero told Charlie that killing people is prohibited by law. The man decided to attack first. He grabbed the bowl with the crystal that was floating above his head and rushed toward the guy. Then breaking it right in front of him, he decided that the gods would like the hero's skills. The main character took out his crossbow, but Charlie was already heading towards the rest of the students, deciding to kill them first. But they insisted that Sean should be allowed to continue. The attacker again took out his cup. He declared that the gods were with him and their radiance was eternal. When suddenly he felt that someone appeared behind him. Sean stopped. He didn't think it was right to kill anyone so he only left a deep cut on the heretic's arm. But the enemy again gathered his strength and ran towards the hero. He brought the cup close to his face and smiled intimidatingly. Charlie did not give up and attacked again and again, but Sean could only dodge him, so they moved in a kind of dance. When the observation post finally noticed that a heretic had broken into the building, Mike turned to the teacher to deal with the incident. He entered the workshop and saw that two people were fighting. Then he tried to shout to the guy that killing a heretic was allowed. There was also a reward for his murder, which Lupine successfully shouted about. And then Sean became more decisive and took out his favorite blade. Grabbing the attacker by the hand with which he was holding the cup, he sharply ran the sharp weapon across his neck, causing Charlie to bleed and fall dead to the ground. The hero's classmates were very frightened by the incident. They could not believe that he had killed the heretic so cruelly. Sean then approached Lupine again. He wanted to know why he had never heard of this law allowing the killing of a non-believer. The teacher noted that only a truly awakened one will be able to understand the rules and the way in which they are written. Oscar cried out for responsibility for the murder, but Lupin defended him, asking if they were seeing a dead man for the first time. And since I think the guy is so cruel, why did they decide to kill themselves? And if the main character had not stopped Charlie, then everyone else would have died. He said that they would soon disappoint everyone and he wanted to see it. The man called on everyone present to look at the corpse at its wounds and its eyes, to face the fear that would help them win. Chen volunteered first. He said that his father is the head of the security department. If he is not afraid, then he cannot afford it either. Lupin addressed those who had chickened out and did not approach the dead body, suggesting that the best outcome for them would be to remain ordinary people and return to school. Lupin then turned to the hero and asked him to follow him. On the street, he began to ask if he had killed before, since the experience was noticeable. Having received a positive answer, he asked when the first time happened. Sean admitted that he first killed when he was five, six years old. The teacher was very surprised when he realized the hero's words, but Sean tried to justify himself by noting that killing is not prohibited in a criminal city. Then Lupine decided to open up completely. The guy was the best of everyone he had met. With his talents, he could become invincible. Lighting a cigarette, he said that he would not comment on the hero's past, but as his teacher, he hoped that he still had a good heart. Having insistently asked Sean to never point a weapon at defenseless people, the guy promised to try. But today he decided to fight for a just cause and receive the Moj reward. Lupin promised that if the organization did not reward him for saving people, then he himself would give him money. The guy took out his knife. The teacher asked what he was up to. Sean wanted to cut up the evil spirits and sell them in parts since they are valuable. The teacher decided to warn the hero that those who have recently transformed are inexpensive and their meat is bitter. Mason approached Lupin. He said that he had resolved a small misunderstanding, but the teacher was interested in whether he could trust him. The captain advised not to delay the reward for certifying the hero, otherwise he might get angry, and if he finds out that the teacher took the reward, he might even kill him. He agreed that it was worth hurrying up with this. Sean walked into the CCTV room where Mike was already waiting and greeted him. He was glad that they were able to resolve all the differences between them. He said that he wanted to trim the recording so that they could get a double reward for saving two people. The hero did not agree, since cutting for money went against the rules, and those who do not follow them die very soon. Mike realized that the guy wants to be honest. Then, the driver decided to invite them to continue to cooperate. If they ever had such an opportunity again, he wanted to become his eternal patron. Sean was forced to repeat again that it was against the law to kill people, and if a man even thought about murder, 
he would immediately report him. Having greatly frightened the examiner, he began to refuse his own offer. He was no longer so decisive, but wanted to think later about who he should work with better. Sean reminded himself of the third point of the crime city, never get close to idiots, no matter if they are friends or enemies. Oscar and Chen continued to sit next to the heretic's corpse. The rest sat on the sidelines and tried not to look at the dead body. Mike walked into the plant with a flying gait. He joyfully informed everyone that they were finally going home and they could get on the bus. All the students sat comfortably on the school bus. Chen sat down next to Sean again. He turned to the hero and promised to help him with his business upon his return. The guy didn't immediately remember what his classmate was talking about, but soon realized that it was about increasing his father's sentence and thanked him. Chen was very happy when suddenly Oscar, who was sitting behind them, touched the hero's shoulder and asked him for private lessons to learn how to kill like him. Sean noted that they were too kind-hearted for such things and was also surprised that they wanted to commit murder so quickly, even though it was illegal. For a second, it seemed to the hero that people in the criminal city were friendlier. But Oscar tried to explain that, due to his tongue tightness, he could not express himself normally and only wanted to become stronger. Then he, in all seriousness, advised his classmate to get rid of his hair. Only after that he would be more intimidating. As soon as they arrived back at school, everyone got off the bus and Mike approached the hero to find out if everything went well. Sean immediately headed to the director's office. As soon as he entered there, he immediately announced to everyone that he had completed the task. Harry had already heard about this, but there were no certification results yet and there was no specific list either. And since this is a deal, then we need to wait until everything becomes clear. The hero was eager to find out where he was on the list and the driver was more than sure that he would definitely be in first. The director did not understand why the guy was asking some passerby about such things. He asked who Mike was. Sean said that he suspects that the driver is from the province and he may decide everything at this certification. The director immediately changed his face. He shook the man's hand and apologized to him, although he was not surprised that such a young and promising handsome man worked at the ministry. Then he began to complain about the working conditions of their school. They did not receive any money or resources, and all that remained was to observe the talents. Harry asked what department he was from, and when he heard that he was from the reserves, he immediately changed his mercy to anger, since Mike was useless to him. He was upset that he was not immediately informed that he was serving in the reserves and had no useful role in the ministry. Sean asked to receive the promised reward, and Harry pulled out three green minerals for him as promised earlier. Suddenly, the hero's phone vibrated in his pocket. It was his classmate, who could not contain his delight at meeting his father, considering him cool. Chen went to visit his father in the prison cell, but instead, Sonny read the hand of a police officer, and he was even a little jealous of him. But under his leadership, the crime was successfully reclassified as committing indecent acts against women. Also adding that the hero's father would not be released very soon, Sean was very happy and hoped that the man would spend his whole life in prison. Meanwhile, Mike led the hero to the main hall of the secret ministry. Everything around was made of marble, and there were many people present. The examiner was delighted with the building. He was waiting for a response from the hero, but the guy didn't care. He didn't even take pictures of anything. The guys were standing in the center of the hall when suddenly the girl behind the reception desk noticed them. She couldn't believe how Mike ended up there. The administrator immediately picked up the phone and informed everyone in the office that the guy had come to the unit again. The girls immediately declared an emergency and closed the information desk, placing a sign on it. People in line did not understand what had happened in a minute because they had literally just been working and then suddenly closed. Sean realized that it was about someone he knew. He had long realized one simple truth of a criminal city. The talker should not be trusted. A girl with ponytails approached the reception desk. Her captain had gone on a mission. Many wounded were now in the hospital. They were ready to give a reward for his rescue. Then the employee asked the girl to calm down and not panic, and then tell everything from the very beginning about what happened and in detail. The visitor stated that she had heard earlier that they were now fighting heresy and that they were giving a reward for saving people. She was afraid that their captain would die in this mission. The administrator asked her to wait, as she needed to check the legitimacy of the law in the city's political tract. As soon as she found the right article in the book, she was surprised that such a rule actually existed. But during the war, those who have time should record a video. The girl immediately handed over the required flash drive. Then the administrator turned it onto the computer and saw terrible footage of the fighting. Those who asked for help began to cry and beg for help with the task, namely to delay time. 
Otherwise, their captain would really die. But the employee did not have such rights. So she abruptly stood up from her chair and ran to try to find the manager. Mike didn't expect that this was possible either and was glad that this crazy woman had an idea, wondering how such professionals could make a mistake. Then Mike decided to take a risk too and try his luck in the same way, which he wouldn't do for money. He gutted his hair to look more excited and ran to another employee, begging him to save them. He had information that his captain would also die, and so there were no arms or legs left. He begged her to give him a letter of recommendation. Otherwise, she would also be responsible for the death of the guard commander Channing, a reserve officer. Suddenly, behind Mike, there was a huge figure of a man with burning eyes, and Sean assumed that this was exactly the one he was talking about. Therefore, he was forced to immediately change his rhetoric. Now his captain has become the bravest and most powerful and cannot die. The girl behind the counter got really angry with him because he wasted her work time, and she asked him to leave so the next customer could get help. The captain, still standing behind the guy, finally raised his voice. He asked how it could be that he was now somewhere on the brink of death with only his head. Mike pretended to be surprised to see his captain and then hugged him and promised to explain everything to him right away. He secretly whispered some news into the man's ear, which made him ask if this guy was really as cool as they say he was. Oliver decided to be the first to approach Sean and introduce himself. He offered his help. If suddenly someone offended him, he would be able to explain everything clearly to everyone. Then the hero decided to be frank and said that he doesn't like fights at all. All he wants is to get as much money as possible. The man urged him to relax and look at him. He was quite sure that he would get the money today, but Sean thought it was suspicious. Having stood in line behind the girl, he had no doubt that he would succeed, but she was determined to give him back if he tried to ruin anything for her. Finally, the leader came out. He approached the girl, but Oliver pushed her away and demanded that he be first because his subordinate had just told him that he was dying. The director immediately understood what was going on and saw through their plan, even though he is a video and a man of the hero of the war with demons. But every day he does nothing. Having asked the man to wait, he turned to the girl for whom he was called. He was surprised that such a talented old and young generation was standing in front of him at the same time. But suddenly he shouted at the administrator that she did not recognize them as scammers, asked to remember their faces and blacklist them. Lenny was already quite angry with the captain's behavior because he could not complete a single simple task and said goodbye to him. Oliver wasn't going to leave so easily. He suddenly grabbed Sean and asked if he knew who this guy was, which the director was very surprised by. Since the officer himself is in the reserve and the guard commander, believes that this guy's status is higher than his, then he must be some kind of very important person. The man said that the hero was his good friend, who shed blood for the sake of humanity and killed evil spirits for the sake of humanity. But the director was adamant. If he indulges all these impudent people every day, then he will rob Moj. Oliver got angry. They butted heads, preparing to fight to the last of their strength. They hated each other and wanted to figure it out quickly. But suddenly, Sean interrupted their squabble. The guy said that according to the criminal code, those who fight in the city without any reason are punishable by imprisonment and a fine. The hero stated that he would submit documents to complete the task. And if he was refused without reason, then he had the right to have his legitimate interests guaranteed. Oliver and Mike looked at each other. They both doubted that the main character was in his right mind. Since he was speaking in memorized phrases from the code, Sean handed over his video of the battle but the director sincerely did not understand why he would watch it and then give him a new task. The administrator opened the video on her computer and immediately noticed that there was a montage. The hero did not deny this, but suggested that they invite a specialist to analyze the situation, since the forces were not equal and without his help, everyone would have died. Suddenly, Lenny ordered to let the guy through and give him the entire reward in full, in accordance with the standard. The girl agreed and explained that the application had been sent for consideration and within three working days, the money would be credited to his account. Sean thanked them, but he was very interested in the reason why the director suddenly changed his anger to mercy and allowed them to give out the reward. But the man had his own reasons. He asked if the hero had thought about working in the secret ministry, but the guy had no such plans yet. Then Lenny decided to introduce himself and asked to trust him because as soon as the hero enters the secret government, his career will not end there. Oliver overheard what the director was saying. He warned Sean as he saw bad intentions in this proposal. The man left his business card and left silently. The officer tried to justify himself that this time he was unlucky. There was no need to doubt his strength. Then, grabbing Mike with him, he dragged him out 
but the driver resisted, as he still hoped to get his money. Sean got to the school, where Chen ran up to him at the entrance. He was very happy about the return of the hero. Without him, some changes had happened, and many were unhappy. He cried with joy that now everything would be fine. Since his friend was with them again, they could eliminate all the troubles together. The hero was surprised by such cordiality, then clarified whether the guy was really ready to fight together. But he went off topic, saying that the teacher was looking for Sean. The guy came to the cafe that his classmate had pointed out to, where he found a teacher who immediately got down to business, pointing to the waiter. The hero recognized this guy. The other kids from school call him Lame Van. Lupine clarified how he looked, but Sean couldn't find anything else to say but with his eyes. It turned out that the waiter had once been a reserve officer, trained there for two years, but due to the fact that there was no free data, he went beyond the dawn outpost. On the third day, evil spirits attacked at night and broke his leg, and he had no choice but to return home again. Despite the fact that he had trained for two years and had not spent even three days in the war, the teacher regretted that things were not so rosy for people now. Lupin tried to provoke Sean's emotions by asking whether he would have saved him if the guy had gotten into danger before his eyes or not. The teacher saw with his own eyes how the rescued man pointed a knife at his savior and also saw how three lives were given because of one bun stained with blood. But at the same time, he understood that there was no point in forcing the guy since this world had never come to his defense before. Therefore, why did he suddenly decide that he could force the hero to go defend this world from the attack of monsters? Sean was about to take out his blade, ready to strike. But the teacher changed the subject, curious if the hero had friends. His girlfriend was still in the Forbidden City, and she had a little less than a year left. Lupin continued his provocations, bringing in the hero's girlfriend. He would have saved her if someone was hunting her. Then Sean, without the slightest doubt, immediately replied that he would kill anyone who looked badly at her or tried to hurt her. The teacher continued. He wanted to know what he would do if the whole world came as an attacker. But Sean was ready to destroy everyone. Lupin then turned around again and looked at the lame Vaughn. He did the same. Only in his case, he was protecting the entire world and not just one person. The hero was surprised that the guy was protecting people. But the older man teacher interrupted him and called him to go to the same place with him. They went for a short walk until their feet brought them to the veterans camp, which is where Lupin wanted to take the guy. The main watcher came out to meet them. He was dissatisfied with the fact that the teacher considers this place a zoo and rarely comes. But this time, he brought someone with him again. Sean noticed that an adult magazine was showing from under the man's jacket. The stranger carefully examined the guy and noted that he looked good. But the hero suddenly rattled off the rules again. According to the criminal code, the public sale of illegal video material is punishable by arrest and a fine. Old John did not understand what the guy was hinting at, and Sean was interested in how much it would be enough and showed three fingers. The former officer asked Lupin to wait a little, as he wanted to talk a little with his students in private. Stepping aside, the man asked the guy in surprise if he really wanted to get 30 coins for silence. But Sean asked for 300. The caretaker got angry, accusing the hero that he also probably bought the CDs for himself, admitting that he only bought two for himself to earn money. But Sean knew very well that such discs could be bought in the north of Mobe at Brown's Music Store. They sell one disc for one yin, which meant that the man still had 800 of his earnings left. John was very upset. He did not agree to the amount announced by the hero. He was ready to pay less. And if not, he allowed everyone to tell that he had no shame. The hero said with confidence that if he decides to inform on the man, he will be able to receive a much larger amount. John immediately retreated with scammers, you just need to deceive in his opinion. And he earned money for his wake. Sean had already managed to dial the police number, but the caretaker snatched the phone from his hands and a voice came from the receiver asking if he was talking to John. The former officer was scared and quickly replied that the caller was mistaken and he was just showing off. How could he know the great hero and ended the call? Having agreed on the amount, he returned the phone and continued to rant that he could not even bargain with the guy. After all, he was a hero. He guarded and pacified demons for the last 30 years, shed blood for the sake of people, and then paid the extortionist. Lupin watched them from afar. He thought that John really liked Sean. He was glad that they hit it off. Returning to the teacher, the caretaker sarcastically reported that he had raised his student well. The teacher was embarrassed and delighted at his kind words and thanked him, promising that he would continue to try. Sean suggested that the man change his management model by changing the contents of the discs to an anti-fraud model, and then he would not have to worry. Although old John was dissatisfied with being tricked by the young guy, 
He noted that he knew a little about business. Then he decided to wonder if Sean had already woken up. The hero shared that he would have to do this this week. Then the man approached him and asked how many patterns he had already received. The hero decided to remain silent and not share this information. The caretaker laughed because the guy was so cautious and called him indifferent and also urged him to learn to trust others. Lupine and Sean went on about their business, stopping at the graves where old John's wife, son, and parents were buried. He prepared the last grave for himself, lives alone, and at the same time, two governments of evil spirits changed under him. The teacher explained that people can live in different ways, but the human race needs those who are able to protect it. He still hoped that the guy would choose just such a fate for himself and become a worthy fighter and representative of humanity. The teacher touched the hero's head to stroke him, and although Sean clenched his hands into fists, he did not take out the blade this time. Lupin believed that a crime city is just a crime city, and the world is so huge, and the hero needs to hear, see, and feel it. Old man John came running to them, shouted that they should not play with his feelings and leave, since this was his family crypt, not a zoo. Meanwhile, in one of the offices of the ministry, a man in a black cloak was discussing on the phone with a divine servant, the need to speed up the plan. He stated that the last operation in the province was too big. Even the Ministry of Exorcism joined in the purge. They suffered significant losses, and during the certification, the city is guarded the most. If they decide to act, it will greatly affect their plan. The divine servant stated that he was personally involved in this matter and was well aware of the plan. The man apologized and hung up. Sean came back to the director's office. Along the way, he talked about his awakened object, a stick. He also noted that his strength has tripled, his speed has doubled, and his combat effectiveness has increased tenfold. Now he must try to strengthen his weaknesses. Harry decided to check to see if Sean could guarantee in the final exam that his results would be moved up by 10. The hero was not sure of this. The rule of his homeland was that one should not be so sure if one does not know all the information. The director regretted that he had previously bargained with him. So this time he began to offer less for each promotion on the list. Previously, the threshold was 100. He offered to give this amount every time, and if he reached first place, he would receive 10,000. Sean decided that they were laughing at him. And since he is proud and knows his worth, he said goodbye to Harry and headed towards the exit. The director was afraid that he might miss such a chance and quickly ran after the hero. He admitted that he had argued with the head of the education department. If they rise to third place in the regional list, they will be allocated funds. Then he suggested dividing them into two. The main character wanted to help climb the list and get money, but he also knew other ways to earn much more. Harry didn't expect to hear this, but Sean had already suggested improving his plan. For example, the three students could come up with a school uniform together. Once the director sends his approval to management to change the clothing, he can print an advertisement on it. And when students take good seats and give interviews in uniform, they will thus become walking advertising posters. This way they will achieve fame, and I will be happy to spend the money on a school uniform. Harry was delighted with such instructions on how to earn money. The director said that he could be trusted, and also that the head of the education department was his old friend from the war, so they would arrange everything. Sean decided to ask if the director was a reserve officer. Harry answered in the affirmative and wanted to know why he was asking about this. But the hero remembered the words of old man John, that only idiots come out of the reserve and realize that Apparently, the director should not be particularly trusted. Already leaving the office, Sean once again decided to clarify how they were going to divide the funds received. Harry had already managed to change the conditions. Now he was offering the guy a little more than before and considered it a rather generous offer. Sean was still unhappy with this arrangement and did not answer. Then, the director freaked out and eventually agreed to receive a smaller share himself. As soon as the hero accepted the agreement, the director immediately ran to put a seal on the agreement to seal their deal. The guy took out his phone and said that a paper contract was not needed since he recorded everything on a voice recorder. The hero walked out the door, leaving Harry in doubt. He just wanted money and hoped that with this recording, Sean would not be able to write a denunciation against him. A week later, the hero received a new uniform with various advertisements on the back, including one about picking locks. Since the exam was about to begin, Sean decided to ask Chen for help in preparing, who begged his friend not to hit him anymore. The classmate was already completely beaten. Blood was flowing from his nose. He cried in pain and then asked to beat him more slowly. But Sean was already preparing to strike again, and with all his strength, he pushed the punching bag that his assistant was holding. 
The guy could barely stand on his feet and dreamed of ending this as quickly as possible. Although the hero seemed kind to him, he could also cause a lot of pain. Oscar was watching them. He specially transferred to this school to increase his combat effectiveness. Seeing how hard his friend, whom Sean had already begun to throw from side to side, was getting, he became scared. But he still decided not to miss this opportunity to prepare for the exam and ran to the guys. Sean didn't have much trouble defeating both of them. Chen was glad when he finally finished, and the opponents were knocked to the floor. The main character decided to go outside and was standing leaning on the wall of the school building when a teacher approached him and asked what he was doing there. The guy couldn't understand if he suddenly had to fight with others during the exam. What should he do? He wouldn't want to do that. Lupin suggested that he shoot past or dull his blade, but Sean knew that it was impossible to deliberately damage the weapon. He was tormented by doubts, and he really wanted to know why it was forbidden to kill people in the city. The teacher laughed at these words and put his hand on his shoulder and was surprised to notice that the guy was relaxed and kept his hands in his pockets. The man asked if the hero remembered that veteran with a lame leg from the cafe. And Sean responded in the affirmative. He was going to go to a veteran's camp tomorrow because his only son was also in the reserves. But lately, Moog had been constantly urging him on, saying that his time had come and he had no children, so he had to go to the camp. Lupin wanted to put Sean on his resume since he was his student, which counts as a child, and then he could stay. The hero was not against it. He immediately agreed, which greatly pleased the teacher, who continued to look at the guy encouragingly. They then proceeded to register the exam participants, approaching the Mobe city gate. They walked up to the line and took a seat. Lupin encouraged the hero. The receptionist asked him to give his name, age, number, and name of the accompanying person. Sonny was in prison and therefore could not attend the certification. The administrator asked who was standing next to him. The teacher took everything into his own hands and asked to write down his name as an accompanying person since he is his teacher and guardian. Suddenly, somewhere behind the wall in the city, a large explosion occurred. Everyone around immediately turned their attention to the sound. Those present could not understand whether an explosion had occurred. But the teacher already understood that it happened either at the school itself or somewhere near it. The registrar notified everyone that it was the heretics who staged a rebellion, but people had already been sent there to deal with them. He also asked everyone to calm down. They could continue. The teacher told his student that he would be waiting for him. Sean left for the exam. People began to run away in panic, and Lupin headed into the city. But the administrator stopped him and said that it was dangerous there. The teacher introduced himself as a reserve officer and said that he used to guard the outposts for pacifying evil spirits, and it was his duty to protect the human race. The people around also picked it up and began to name their units and the outposts in which they served. They were all ready to rush into battle to protect the human race, it was their duty as officers. The registrar was not going to go with them. He claimed that it would be difficult to get through, so he would wait for them at the headquarters. He also asked them to return victorious, but the other officer was surprised that he was afraid because the people were attacked by demons and before they had stood to the end. Unbelievers in black robes tried to enter the building one after another. No one blocked their way from the street. Mike was already inside. Two girls stood next to him. He was surprised that the heretics actually dared to attack the school. The girls were also ready to fight. They planned to act quickly and fight to the death. It would be faster. The heretics monotonously called on the servants of God from different cities to guide people on the true path. The captain was already holding his weapon behind his back. Since Moog was not there, he decided that he would lead the troops and finish the battle in five minutes and cut off the heads of those who disobeyed his orders. Lupin approached them. He was surprised that the guy who had barely joined the reserve was already such an idiot. The volunteer who came with the teacher remembered Mike. He was beaten every day in the army, and he cried, although he remembered him very young. The teacher grinned at him. The driver was distracted for a second, and his own people had already beaten him, calling him a loser. The man decided to take everything into his own hands. He ordered to block the gates and prevent new victims. He brought people with him to protect the school. Meanwhile, old man John was fishing at a veteran's camp when he heard his unit commander calling his name. He was in a hurry to get to him, which alarmed the caretaker a little. He was afraid that someone had died and wondered what could have happened since they came for him in person. The director asked him to return from seclusion. Another officer from the 4th Division asked him to do so. The caretaker was afraid for a second that his old enemy, Marcel, had shown up, but for another reason he refused to return. Lenny continued to beg him, but the man was sure that if he returned now with this level of training to the outpost, he would be blown away by the wind. Since the appearance of Jin, 
the first generation has almost completely died, just like the second, and the third generation is barely holding the front. The director insisted that they could not resist without the officer's participation. But the man was adamant. Then he took out his gift and again begged him to return. The old man was surprised to see the magic ball. He did not expect that they would spend on this medicine, which would return his body to its previous state. He reported that the city was attacked and there was chaos there. Lenny begged his help to restore order. Otherwise, he would simply witness the death of people. But old John only got angry when he heard the director's monologue because he threatened him with the lives of ordinary people. Lenny agreed to any conditions that the man could offer, but he himself fought for Mobe and had nothing to give him. The caretaker nevertheless decided to try to take the ball in his hands, when suddenly the heretics appeared in front of them, who were surprised that the support of the clan would return. Men in black robes, as well as the teachings of a thousand gods, servants, and protectors of God, greeted the respected John. Lenny was surprised that three of them came this was not enough to try to defeat them together. It didn't matter to them. They said that if John ate the medicine, then within three days, the demons would begin a large-scale battle for the outpost. The old man grinned at such a stupid attempt to intimidate him, so he nevertheless took the ball and swallowed it. Changes invisible to the eye instantly occurred to him, and a long spear with a purple glow appeared behind him. The non-believers were afraid. The eighth highest state of enlightenment appeared before them. It was incredible although he still needed the seventh Bodhi. The former officer appeared before them full of strength. He noticed that they tried a lot to hide their spy in Moj. The heretics tensed when they learned that he had guessed. John decided that he had already said enough, so it was time for them to say goodbye to this world. With a huge airy hand, he threw his spear into the sky, and then in one motion it killed the leader. The dying man wanted to ask one last question, but John had no time to talk to him, so he left him to bleed to death. The caretaker of the veterans' camp turned to the director and asked him to call his friend and tell him that it was time to get the nets. Lenny did not understand the request, but still took out the phone. The old man was surprised that all the reserve officers were so stupid and did not understand obvious words. The director, with a bit of distrust, dialed the number of an officer he knew and conveyed to him the words that it was possible to remove the nets, and he was immediately understood without questions. Surprised that in such an environment they could think about fishing, he condemned the man but he grinned that everyone leaves the academy as some kind of idiot. Old John was already walking toward the settlement. He called the director with him, because he believed that the time had come to settle scores with the evil spirits. Lenny was still standing, but the other veterans noticed the officer's departure. They were very upset that he was leaving them and were afraid that he would not return, but the caretaker was glad that he felt young again, and if his old bones could still serve humanity, then it was worth it. Meanwhile, Sean was already heading to the test site, he was eager to finish it as soon as possible. Monsters appeared in front of him in a video of huge animals with large claws. They had powerful defense, and it would not be possible to kill them with a crossbow. He took out his awakened item, a stick, but he was still surprised that it appeared, since he doubted that he had already awakened. One of the monsters noticed the hero and was already running towards him. He had a huge tail. He rushed at the guy who was holding his stick in his hands. The monster's eyes changed. It was as if he was hypnotized. Sean took out a blade and struck at his body. Blood sprayed from the wound, and the hero noticed that his last attack was very successful. Then he decided to put the staff in the ground, thereby luring all the animals. They looked at him. The hero pushed off from the ground. In just a few minutes, he was able to kill them all, without even trying too hard and leaving behind only the corpses of monsters. Next, he noticed huge birds that attacked him in a flock. But this was not a big test for him. He easily killed them, too. The observer of the test was surprised that all the animal spirits died, although very little time had passed. He opened an interactive map of the area and realized that someone was already at the very finish line. He suspected that it was the same Sean. The examiner really hoped that after so many years, the trouble had finally left the city thanks to one hero. The guy rushed to continue the test. He wanted to quickly complete the certification in order to see with his own eyes what was happening in the city. Suddenly, a new evil spirit appeared in front of him, a huge dog that looked like a tiger which forced the hero to stop abruptly. Taking out small, sharp needles, he threw them at the monster. But they did not leave a trace of him, simply hitting his skin and falling to the ground. Then the hero decided to try another method. He wound the rope around his finger, but first decided to try throwing his blade at the animal. This time the weapon wounded the monster, which greatly provoked him, and he tried to attack the man. But the hero managed to jump away. Sean wrapped the rope around the monster's neck and then tightened it, thus strangling him. 
and victory in the battle was not long in coming. Immediately after this, a portal opened in front of the hero, and he could return to the city. He was very glad that everything was finally over. He was in a hurry to go out to meet his teacher, but did not know whether he would be waiting for him alive or dead. The hero left first. The registration administrator was surprised that someone had already managed and left, although very little time had passed. Immediately leaving the portal, Sean asked the receptionist what his place was after the test. The man didn't quite know how to answer his question. It was possible that he was the first in the entire province, but at least he was the first in the city. Satisfied with these words, the hero headed toward the city, but the administrator tried to stop him. Since it was very dangerous in the city, besides, the guy was injured and first he had to deal with it. Sean took out his crossbow and pointed it at the administrator, telling him that he would kill him if he ever interfered with him again. But the man did not give up. He declared that the hero would have to kill him because he could not allow him to enter the city since he was responsible for his life. The main character was surprised for a moment that the guy was not afraid of death. But then he thought that it was just a pretense to play a scene. He was not ready to answer to the law for killing a man, so he shot an arrow near the man's feet. Then he thanked him but said that only he himself was responsible for his life and asked not to interfere with him, otherwise he would have to use force. Meanwhile, Michael fought side by side with the girl against the heretics. He shouted and invited them to taste the taste of his ax. His comrade used her power of awakening and pierced one of the non-believers with a stream of light. With the help of her lightsaber, she continued to kill the heretics one by one so that they flew away a fair distance. Michael noticed another girl also fiercely fighting the followers of the false faith, she was delighted with her capabilities. They all stood next to each other, but more and more people in capes continued to surround them. The defenders continued to fight. Michael decided to use his awakened weapon, a huge hammer. He ran toward the crowd and began to swing it. But suddenly one of the heretics in a cloak was able to bypass his blow and then delivered his own, causing blood to spurt out of the man's mouth. Seeing such injustice, one of the girls attacked this unbeliever from behind and killed him outright. Mike wasn't happy about letting her save him, so he forced himself to his feet, so no one would think he was weak. The number of non-believers did not decrease in any way. The guys doubted that they would be able to stop them and hoped that the rest would be able to protect the students. The heretics continued to advance further into the city. They called on their gods to help them overthrow the resistors. The director stood guard over his school, along with the teacher. They realized that they still could not stop the opponents at the city gates. Lupin kept his sword at the ready. He knew they would have to hold out until reinforcements arrived. He immediately ran into the thick of things, trying to attack first. He successfully killed the heretics. He did not expect this and was afraid. From the windows of the school, the students watched the carnage outside as the headmaster warned them that he would fight anyone who attacked his people. At his age, he also passed through the outpost of pacifying evil spirits so that his blade of awakening appeared behind him. The man pulled him out and went to attack the non-believers. He was quite sneaky for his age and successfully destroyed his opponents. Lupin was glad that he was again in the thick of the action. He had not had so much fun for a long time. Harry supported that all this was similar to what happened 10 years ago. Then they were engaged in the destruction of the sect and the protection of the human race. A man who suddenly appeared chuckled at his words. The leader of the heretics believed that to cleanse the world of evil and build a new order for people means to give them a new future. The director did not agree with his words. He thought that their sect did not care about people. They only seduced young people. Jack wanted light to shine on the earth, and then people could live forever in unity with the gods. He believed that people like Harry would not understand this. Lupine no longer wanted to listen to the nonsense that the heretic preached, not seeing the point in it. He proposed starting a fight. The leader liked the teacher's straightforwardness. He smiled at him, but then immediately rushed into battle. Jack appreciated the sword with which the teacher parried the blow. It had a euphonious name, the Devil's Gravedigger. But the heretic believed that today, the people they so fiercely defended would be killed with this sword. They continued to fight, the leader declaring that eventually, divine light would be shed on this world. The man called all the protectors dirt on the surface of this world. Then he continued to call upon the gods and divine light. Jack rose up, but instead of another attack, he rushed toward the school. Then Lupin realized that his target was the students. The teacher was not going to give his children to be torn to pieces by heretics. He was ready to fight for their good and lives. Accompanying an unbeliever flying along the ground on magic wings, he tried to jump to him and swung his weapon. He was able to hit him on the head with the end of his sword, causing the man to fall on the asphalt. 
and punch a huge hole there. Jack congratulated the teacher for being able to anger him, but he didn't care about his opponent's mood. He considered him annoying. Lupin again tried to kill his opponent with his sword, but the leader caught the blade with his wings, which greatly surprised the teacher. The chief heretic easily held the sword with his strength, not allowing it to pass further. He declared that after death, the teacher acquired a divine body. He then released the feathers and they caused numerous deep wounds on the body of the teacher, who began to doubt his abilities. Trying to hide from the flying sharp feathers, he crouched on the floor and then screamed at the right moment to activate the full power of his power. And although the ray of red light directed by the heretic touched him, he was able to do the same in the opposite direction, hitting Jack's heart. The heretic at first did not believe that the teacher managed to strike, but already dying, he praised Lupin for his resourcefulness. The school was liberated from the enemy. The teacher declared that anyone who attacked his people would certainly die himself. The teacher sat down on the asphalt and stuck his sword next to him. There were many ragged cuts on his body, and he was slowly bleeding. Suddenly, through half-closed eyelids, he could see Sean approaching him. But at first, he didn't believe his eyes and thought that he had already died, and it seemed to him. The student proudly announced that he took first place in the city, but he really didn't know what place he took in the province. Lupin admitted that in his eyes, he was always the best. Sean noted that his patron was dying, but the man hoped that death would free him. He pulled out an object in the form of a beak and gave it to the hero. It was his pride, and with the help of the object, Sean will be able to prove that he is part of the hero's family. The man admitted that he fought to, to protect the guy. It didn't matter to him that he came from a crime-ridden city. Reaching out his hand, he patted the student on the head and instructed him to never allow others to change him and to do whatever he thought was right. A bright white light appeared behind the hero's back and literally a moment later, the teacher died, remaining sitting by his sword. Sean was furious. He took out his dagger and shouted that now all the heretics would die from his weapon. He jumped up and headed toward them. Passing one rebel after another, he cut them with his blade. He killed them all without stopping. Single-handedly, he killed all the remaining heretics. Mike could not believe that the guy dealt with the infidels so cruelly. Old John came to the square and saw the body of the dead teacher. He could not believe that they had killed his friend. Vowing to avenge Lupin, he grabbed his spear and drew a circle of their purple glow, killing the remaining non-believers. When suddenly a huge figure with red glowing eyes appeared from behind the trees, the monster did not expect to see old man John. Suddenly, Mike realized that this was their plan. First, the heretics destroyed their main force and now the king of the demons had come already. The caretaker of the veteran's camp was happy to see the six-star demon king. It was a gift for his return to his post. Orhan stated that despite the fact that last time he was able to kill the king, this does not mean that he will succeed this time. But John was determined to destroy him. The reserve officer pushed off the ground and flew above the snake's head. He tried to hit his spear between the beast's eyes, but Orhan laughed at the old man's arrogance and at the fact that this was all he could do and then pushed him away. The man was not going to give up. He jumped up again, charged the spear with force, and threw it furiously at the snake. This time it was possible to penetrate the monster's armor, and the beam of light hit the target, and Orkhan roared in pain and then fell dead. Old John was pleased with himself. He declared that in order not to disgrace the spirit of the hero, all that was necessary was to destroy all the Gentiles.